Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Hartglass, and it's time for another episode of It's All About Food. And this program is going to be a little different. Instead of talking mostly about what's going on today, we're going to look back a little bit in time and find out how the hell we got to where we are today. <laughs> and we're going to be talking with Carolyn Cobalt, who is a research fellow at the University of Cambridge, where she investigates the history of food and science. Her work has been published in Annals of Science, Osiris, Ambix, and Business Insurance, among others. She has a new book called A Rainbow Palette, How Chemical Dyes Changed the West's Relationship with Food. Hello, Carolyn. Hi. Hi. So you are in Great Britain right now, somewhere. Yep. Yes, somewhere. Um, I'm actually on the south coast of, I, I, I study in Cambridge, but at the moment I'm at, on the south coast of England. Very lovely. And uh, something everyone's sharing in common these days is COVID. How are things going where you are? Uh, yeah, uh, um, it's, it's fine. We had, I fortunately about two years ago, I moved my parents into an annex in our house. And my grown up kids all decided when we had true lockdown, they would all work from our home. So we sort of had a family commune for about three, three months, which was actually rather lovely because when your kids grow up and move away, you think you're never, ever going to get them for any length of time back again. So it was sort of a bit like a bonus. Yeah. Yeah. I like finding the good things that come out of this craziness. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are some good things. And I think there are lots of lessons, which I hope society's learn. And in your book as well, I found, that there are different ways to perceive the same story from uh-huh. different That's sides. <laughs> there are always different ways to perceive any story, yeah. And, and some can be very lovely and some can be horribly ugly. <laughs> and maybe yeah, we'll and touch on some of that. Sometimes they're both the same at the same time, yeah. Exactly, yes. I'm looking at the book. It has a lovely cover. It has a gorgeous cover. A gorgeous it? cover of all kinds of treats. Yeah, it's actually a reproduction from a Mrs. Beaton's book, which I'm sure everybody will be familiar with those cookery books from the 19th century. Yeah, maybe not everyone anymore, but... Uh, okay, maybe. Yeah. I miss I miss these things from early cookbooks, the art yeah, and the care and the beauty. We're pretty blessed these days with cookbooks and... Cookbooks have changed quite a bit, and and I look at many of them, and what shall I say? They're just, I'm missing the art, and and not just in the design of the recipes, but the stories and the photos and and the hand drawings. I love the hand drawings that I used to see in cookbooks, and sometimes you see them, just not as much. Okay, so my question is, after looking at this book, which is one-third references. Yeah, I know. (laughs) isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a chicken and the egg. Which came first, the idea to do this book or all of the research you were doing in food for some other reason? How did you discover dyes and their association with what's in food today? It's a long story. It's like everything when you go into academia and, and why you start researching something. I actually had spent um, a good chunk of my working life working as a journalist for a Chicago-based international um, journal actually about risk management um, and insurance. So a lot of my sort of past history involved writing about managing risk. So I suppose that is why I ended up when I went back into academia writing about something that is managing risk. And I actually did, um, when I went back into academia, Um, I did a history of science masters that then led to a PhD. Um, And ironically, I thought having done engineering as a degree many decades ago, that I'd be focusing mainly on um, physics and maths because they were the subjects I loved. And I ended up looking at chemistry and then I ended up looking at industrialization of food. And then I came across um, the fact that chemists were, were, looking at um, making food processing much more efficient and clean and scientific. Um, So they, you know, the first thing I looked at was the fact that 
the chemists wanted to get yeast out of flour because they felt that yeast was a destructive element. And in a, you know, in a century where feeding this expanding population and Malthusian philosophy of we're never going to feed everybody was so important. The, the thought that by putting, by having yeast in your bread, it was actually consuming some of the valuable ingredients in the bread. Um, if they could make bread without that loss um, would be far more efficient. So I looked at the introduction of things like baking powders and that led on to, you know, what constitutes um, a, a a proper legitimate food additive to make your food better and what constitutes adulteration and of course in the 19th century adulteration was a massive public concern um, and it was interesting the things they felt were adulterating the food and things they felt were actually enhancing the food so I and then that led me on to looking at dyes <laughs> yes so an adulterant an adulterant versus a food improver, as you say. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's still a topic today, isn't it? it? Well, what interested me, what surprised me, and what scared me <laughs> was that nothing's changed. No, absolutely. <laughs> I, I and mean, nothing has changed. So nothing has changed. Yeah. And, if you, and a lot of the book deals with the sort of different approaches to um, legislation taken by different countries. And, you know, we're dealing with Brexit at the moment um and you know food legislation and food trade wars and things uh you know it's all the same today and the, the and the and the turning to science to justify why you're banning certain foods or uh protect basically protecting your domestic economy through the, the you know the term of science and and it's it's there's a lot of similarity <laughs> My background's in chemical engineering. I haven't done oh. chemical engineering for a long time, but I invested about 20 years of my life in the semiconductor industry. Oh, wow. and, and before I started there, I worked for DuPont for a year and a half out of college. Oh, you're on familiar territory reading all this. Absolutely. I, when I read about Robert Bunsen, I thought, is he related to the Bunsen burner? And yeah. he's the same guy. <laughs> but there are things you take for granted that... Yeah. That you don't even think about when you've got tons of homework and things yeah, to do. Absolutely. But when I studied, there were lots of things that were left out that my older, wiser self wishes we talked about. And maybe they talk about some of these things today. I don't know. I concentrate on the health of food now, and I'm learning about how in medical school, there are many things that are left out. I just talked to someone last week. The title of her book is what's missing in medicine and what's yeah. missing is prevention and nutrition. Yes. Nutrition is a huge gap in medicine. I mean, it's, it's frightening really when you, when you think, you know, as a lay person, you know, you, you think a lot about what you eat. Um, and even if you look at ancient medicine, you know, the, the Greeks and the Romans, they connected food and, and who you were and what you ate on a really personal basis so that you know certain types could eat certain foods um, and yet I think I remember speaking to somebody recently in sort of public health uh, and medicine and I think doctors are given like a week's training in their whole six-year career on yeah. nutrition that's right yeah. it's, it's not it's, enough yeah but that's another subject I'm yep. just making some <laughs> parallels. And in my own training, a few things were lacking. One was we never learned how to clean up our mess. So when we're kids and we take out our toys <laughs> and we make a mess, we're supposed to clean up afterwards. But I learned in the chemical world, we can make all kinds of products and we can pollute the air and pollute the water. And, and, and when, the, when the life cycle of the product is done, we just put it in a dump. And we don't clean up the mess we make. Yeah. <laughs> it's having a tremendous impact on our planet. Yeah. But that is changing now. You know, we are trying to learn how to value or, or put a cost to those uh, impacts. Yes. The return on investment of any product for its lifestyle has to include cleanup and it doesn't. So we didn't learn that back then. And I hope people are thinking about it now. Yeah. Also, at my early days in industry... There were, there were a lot of things that weren't said, but were understood. 
And I don't know how they did that, <laughs> but I felt things when I worked at DuPont that we were supposed to do things a certain way and not question. And I've seen that and I've read it in your book, how uh, consultants, you had, you had chemists and they were described based on the different functions that they did, consultants, analysts, experts, and depending on who they were working for, might shape the research or the results that they got. Yeah, or, or, or indeed how they presented the research. How it's presented, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we see that today, yeah. and now researchers have to divulge who they're working for. Sometimes they're not as transparent as we like. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was just thinking, I was just frustrated to know, wow, this was going on over 150 years ago in the mid 19th century. Yeah. And, and I don't know why we think it wouldn't have been happening in a sense, because, you know, it, it's sort of who pays the piper is, a, you know, goes back forever. But, but, it, but it, when I came across it, so I'd be looking at court cases and I'd see court experts, so um, analytical chemists, um, saying things about the dyes and if they were working for the pr food producer they'd be saying these dyes are fine there's no problem using them you know the, the, cus the consumer likes his, bu his butter to be a consistent yellow therefore it's fine to use it and then suddenly you'd come across another court case where the same analyst the same expert witness was actually working for the local authority saying it's disgraceful we shouldn't be using these dyes and and it was shocking to see it there in, in black and white, even though you know it happens now. And why wouldn't it be happening then? You know, and even more then, because these some of these public analysts, they were employed sort of on a freelance basis by the state and the local authorities to check food wasn't being adulterated. But there was no way they could uh, earn their living on that. So they, of course, they had to work for the food producers as well, you know, which meant they were able and 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 maybe this goes back to our comments about uh how much time medics get in terms of nutrition because this and we're seeing it with covid all the time the science the science in itself the science itself doesn't necessarily change although it does sometimes but actually how the science is presented and interpreted is always never the same you know, according to who's looking at it. And, you know, we've seen it throughout the whole COVID pandemic, you know, things that you think would be obvious, is a face mask, wearing a face mask safe or not? There are always more than one. Uh, and it's not just who you're working for or the message you're trying to give. Sometimes we just have our own blinders on and there are things we just don't even think about. Just isn't a black and white answer. You know, it's, it's, Yes, of course, face masks work to an extent, but then there are cases that they, you know, so, yeah. So the different parameters that you continually brought up, which apply today and applied back then, for different dyes, colorants that were originally used for textiles, which you'd think were seemingly safe, but we can talk about that in a minute because some of them weren't even safe to put on clothing. And then we put them in our food. All the things to consider. Let's talk about them. So my number one thing to consider is the safety of consuming them in the body and the issues that were involved with that, which I want to talk about. Then there's the appearance. Yeah. And that was... Some would say it was important to the consumer, how it looked. But I got the impression it was more a deceptive tool, which you also yep. mentioned, to make it look like something else or look fresher. Yep. What else was involved? The uh, economics of everything. Yep. <laughs> All of the money. <laughs> yeah. So those were the big issues that I got out of it. And, but you also talked a little bit about ego. I never saw the word ego. <laughs> but I kept hearing ego and that was the careers of the yep. chemists. Yeah. And, and the status of, of chemistry, you know, chemistry was um, a newish 
profession or chemists were a new profession and they were trying to prove themselves in the marketplace as professionals prove themselves as professionals and also keep themselves employed and keep themselves employed yeah so there was a lot of different things in play yeah and when we take a romantic notion a romantic view of things and say we just want the highest quality product for everyone that's safe it's not that easy because there's all these things that are playing into it yeah so i was first surprised to read about uh, maybe i knew these things i don't know but the dyes that were put in textiles and some of them cause all kinds of problem on people's skin yeah so that's that's how before people actually realized they were going into food so the, so the the the, the dye companies. Now these are uh, synthetic dyes. We're not talking about the natural ones. Okay, yeah. So, so to go back to, in 1856, um, a young lad working in um, a laboratory run by a German called Hoffman, who'd been brought over to Britain to try and uh, get the sciences going more in Britain because Germany were way ahead of us. Um, and Hoffman was in tar waste. Coal tar was waste was came out of the gas lighting industry and, and, and was basically all this waste product. Um, and he felt that you you could synthesize various chemicals from this thing that would change our world, which they have done. So he tasked William Perkin, this young lad, with trying to find a synthesized version of quinine which was a drug that came out of um, South America used for malaria. And of course, malaria was a big issue for colonial empires such as Britain who were sending people all over the world um, and they were getting malaria. And, and quinine, because it grew in South America, was in the control of the Spanish empire. So, so Britain and other colonial powers were looking for a way that they could get a ersatz or a, you know a replica chemical that acted like quinine did um, and Hoffman was convinced you could do it out of coal tar waste and and Perkin was doing all these experiments and noticed overnight when he left his bit of coal tar waste that he fiddled around with and synthesized he was left with a sort of purple gunge in the bottom and thought hmm that's interesting purple and of course purple as a dye um, was incredibly expensive which is why it was used by emperors and monarchs and things um, and so that began this whole synthetic dye industry they suddenly chemists realized they could get all these amazing colors out of coal tar waste um, and and led to the the chemical companies we that are huge that we know today started off as aniline and azo dye manufacturing companies. So BASF, Bayer, Sibagaygi, um, Agfa, Herxt, all started off as just aniline dye companies, um, and then realised they could get all sorts of wonderful things out of coal tar waste. You know, uh, drugs and um, perfume and textile dyes and so began producing these textile dyes and of course the textile industry was huge in the 19th century particularly in Britain um, and so the dyes went into the market were, but were often went in and it as with na sort of innocuous non-chemical sounding names and ended up going into food by the food man by the food manufacturers who claimed to have no idea what these dyes were, which may be true because they were being sold these dyes as primrose pink and butter yellow. Um, so what happened? So so they they were already going into food by the 1860s, 1870s without people really realizing. And the first issues that came about were people getting rashes on their skin from the textiles they were wearing, which people knew were being dyed with these new dyes. And initially, the response was, it was the contamination with arsenic, because arsenic by then was a really well-known toxic um, toxin. Um, and because arsenic tends to be found where other metal ores are found, often would, and was used in the process of 
producing many of these dyes, there, there would have been elements of, top, of arsenic in there. So most chemists were set. And of course, when the dyes were created, they were amazing. And so the reputation of these organic chem new organic chemists and chemistry was really linked in with these new dyes that were lit changing the world as we saw it, or they saw it. Um, so, so they, 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 because their reputation was linked with these dyes, it was in their interest not to um, diminish the reputation of these dyes at all. So, of course, it, they, they, the, the big claim was that it was actually the arsenic contamination, not the aniline and azo dyes themselves, um, that were the issue. And, and that went on for a long time until people realised that actually aniline and azo dyes weren't necessarily great for you if consumed in large quantities. But of course, by the time that by the time there was a sense that was an issue and that some of these dyes might be toxic, there were so many vested interests in play because we would we're talking now about the 1880s, 1890s. So the dyes had been used in food by then for 20, 30 years. So consumers had got used to opening their tins of peas and finding the peas were green and not sludgy brown. Um, uh, so, so you had the vested interests of the dye companies, the chemists, uh, the, the politicians who had to feed all these millions of people, you know, going from the countryside into cities to work. So being far removed from the food supply, you had to keep you, you had to get food to the millions of people in this fresh food to the millions of people in the cities or um, canned food in order to feed them. So, you know, the politicians had an interest in making sure that food supply was there. And then the consumers who, you know, realized, whereas maybe their grandmothers and, and parents had used to, were used to seeing their butter change color during the year, according to what the cows were eating at the time. Um, you know, suddenly they were used to their butter being the same colour, you know, whatever time of year it was, whoever was producing it for them. So, you know, they they had a vested interest in a sense of, of, you know, what their food looked like and how they perceived, what they perceived good food to look like. Um, which then made it very difficult to uh, legislate for the dyes. It's a very complicated situation and reading your book makes one understand how complicated and how messy it is. Here we are. And you tell many stories in the book about these dyes and their influence and how chemists dealt with them, how politicians dealt with them, how government officials dealt with them and how the consumer was left to dealt with them. Things are very different now where we have the internet Okay, we have conspiracy theories, but we also have lots yes. of ways to share information that are positive. Yep. So if somebody has a problem with the product, more people can find out about it quickly and kind of figure out where the source is. We have more regulations in place. I'd like to see more. Other people would like to see less, uh, but it's, it's definitely a fascinating subject. You mentioned the color of butter, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit because back then the different countries, you talk primarily about Great Britain and France and Germany and a little bit about the United States, but people were trying to regulate what butter was and what margarine was. Yeah. And we're still having that problem today. Yeah. So I'm a vegan, 32 years vegan, and I'm excited about all the vegan products that come out. I stick more towards whole foods. I don't like things that are manufactured and reading yep. your book. I like them even less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there are so many conversations here in the United States and in, in Europe about what butter is, what cheese is, what mayonnaise is, what meat is, and can it come from a plant? Does it have to come from an animal? And again, there are all these different sides to the story. Yeah. I don't know what your feeling is on what butter should be, <laughs> but for me, my motivation has always been about cruelty to animals. And so I want to take that away from the equation. And if we can have a product that is healthy and satisfying and doesn't torture anything, I think that's a win. 
yeah. Well, of course, margarine, and I don't go into, to, I, I, I go into margarine being used as a substitute for butter right at the beginning. And, and, and the issues with whether it should be dyed yellow, because then it was seen as something that was a fraud and that the could deceive the public because they could think it was butter, okay. which is why some states... Uh, forbade the colouring of margarine um, and some states and countries even um, stipulated that margarine had to be dyed pink so it was they obviously weren't concerned about the actual dyeing and the use of the dyes themselves if they were make, mandating it should be dyed pink it was it was the fraudulent element and whether the consumer could be deceived um, but and, we and get the, that today because there are the dairy manufacturers who say people are being deceived with soy milk and almond milk and yes. cashew yes. cheese and that yes. we don't know what we're buying but yes. we do know what we're buying yes yes and they're, and they're pretending to, i mean we've got we've there's a debate at the moment in in europe as to whether um vegan foods could can call themselves burgers because oh, that's another one and, or nuggets or or sausages or names that are perceived to be um connected with meat yeah in the fact deceiving the public even though they might be called parsnip sausages you know it's <laughs> um but the thing with margarine is in the era i'm talking about margarine was made with beef stearines so it was mm -hmm. very much from animals but but in the 20th century margarine could have been can be made from any material most of which isn't meat you know so any plant but um, in, in your view, I suspect you probably wouldn't want to eat any of it because it's so highly processed. The fact it hasn't gone anywhere near an animal um, still means, doesn't mean it's Sure, because we, we had hydrogenated vegetable oils, which yeah. are making their way exactly. out now. But they were quite popular for a long time and yeah. they're plant-based, but they're a disaster. Yeah. And, and of course, they, they're all sold with um, a lot of scientific-based health claims um yeah <laughs> do you think the public was deceived with the colors in the margarine and other uh, products yes i'm sure they were um and because to put it to put the whole thing in context at the time um i've already mentioned about the fact that food supply chain got much longer as and, and the provenance of food got lost because there were so many millions more people in the cities as opposed to on their farm. And the whole food supply industry was very competitive. And because the chain was longer and it went through different retailers and wholesalers, there, were, there was evidence that um, at each stage of that process, uh, people were trying to get an extra cut. So if, you, if the milk was going from the farm to the city, that each sort of transition phase, the wholesaler might just water it down a bit, add a bit of a lead, you know, yellow dye in to make it look rich and creamy still. And, and while we pay a premium for semi, you know, milk that, that is essentially less creamy, in, in the 19th century, you would want your milk to have as much nutritional value and fat content as possible because that was, you know, a big part of your diet. So actually, um, in that sense, watering down the milk did affect people's nutrition and mm. health. Um, so there, there were those issues going on. And, and in the wine industry, you know, often the wine would be watered down and then, and then fusine, which was a uh, um, red synthetic dye was put in to make it look redder again and cover all that up. So there was, this definitely was deception going on in the marketplace. I was shocked to read about the wine. And my question is, does that happen at all today? Are wines colored? Uh, where do you can buy blue wines, I am told. Um, but, but, but that's a different issue. Our wines, no, I don't think not to the extent they were. I mean, there are still issues with arsenic in wine, but a lot of that is because of the arsenic in the ground you know from pesticides that used to be used there or even naturally occurring in the ground so you know there are contaminants still in wine but not to the extent there were then but even then you have to put it in context because before the synthetic dyes came along um, people were putting really toxic 
uh, stuff into food like lead and arsenic and things. So, you know, one could argue, and actually the chemists did argue that, that the new synthetic dyes were pretty harmless compared to some of the stuff <laughs> that had been going before. And then there was the argument that actually the synthetic, because the, a lot of these chemicals were the same chemicals used in pesticides and insecticides, they were pretty good at killing bacteria in food. So actually, you know, you, you weigh up the risk of, you know, in the 19th century, if you've got food that's got to get into the cities and it's gone off, you know, actually you might be better off with uh, a lot of aniline dyes in it because at least it would have killed the bacteria that probably would have killed you anyway, you know. So, so all these things have to be looked at in a wider context. Well, one thing I liked about your book was it's very objective. We don't yep. know what you, how you feel about anything. No. <laughs> and so I imagine, I know how I took some of the things you described in the book, but I imagine people coming from a different space yep. might, might see your stories differently. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the chemists, the, the protagonist in my story saw these things differently. So, so back to the wine. Yeah. I have all these romantic notions about life 150 years ago <laughs> that are kind of... I wouldn't get too romantic about it, I yeah, suspect. Well, I mean, it starts with the cover of your book and everything was just lovely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I know with the French, I always thought that they wanted their food to be pure. Yeah. And I was so surprised to read about the colorings that were added to wine and how there were the French chemists that were putting these synthetic additives into their food, which was so in opposition to my understanding of what French food is all about. Yeah. Well, you should read some history uh, of uh, a close friend of mine, <laughs> Emma Sparry, is a, is a, um, a historian who writes about the history of French food and she's always claiming that actually French, the, the French were the first people to really industrialize food so you know the first chip factory um, was uh, created by Parmentier who was a French chemist in the 19th century um, the French were the first to process food and can food and, and bottle food um, and and the French and it was a Frenchman who invented margarine, so you know we have all these romantic notions about French food, but they were pretty on the ball when it came to uh, industrializing food. I think I need to come back and read more on the French history of food, so that I'm a little more knowledgeable when I discuss food with my French friends. Yes, they'll hate you. <laughs> they'll hate you. <laughs> <laughs> really, so funny. And then the other thing was. People were adding these synthetic dyes to food. And of course, there were no ingredient labels back then where you had to put what you're putting in foods on the labels. And then there were these analysts who were testing foods to see what was in them and if they were problematic. But they didn't have the equipment that we have today. And if you didn't know what you were looking for, it made it impossible to find it. Yeah. Which actually, I would argue, is still the case today. It's still, the, yeah. There's yeah. plenty of things we don't but, know but, exist. So, so there's a very good book, um, and I think it may be about Dupont, actually, as you mentioned it. Better Living with Chemistry, Tom's, which you said so many times throughout the book. No, to, or Tom's Tom's River, is it? Um, anyway, where where where, you know, basically, if you don't know what you're looking for, and there are thousands of Chemi different chemicals in there and let's face it even natural things are just made of chemicals we all are yeah. it's very hard to you know find what you're looking for and and in this period of time these new dyes were being created um you know faster than any analyst could keep up with it so by the turn of the century um there were estimates vary between sort of 900 to 4,000 different dyes out there um, and who knew what they were, you know, and, and being able to find them in substances of food that were sent to you was, you know, pretty impossible. Pretty impossible. I like yeah. to say, is this a good chemical or is this a bad chemical? 
Yeah. So, chemicals... yes, so even if you could identify the chemicals in there, then trying to determine if they were going to cause you any damage when they were used in such, such tiny quantities. Exactly. Such small quantities. And what we know today, unfortunately, is many of the toxins that we consumed in earlier generations are transferred through generation to generation and are impacting our health today and the health of our children yeah. in ways that we never imagined. And, and then you have synergy. You know, some of these things aren't toxic when, when they're in their pure form, but then when they're consumed with other things, mm. uh, you know, and, and, and it's, yeah. Yeah, that's a big problem today, even yeah. today, because yeah. we always like to do the simplest possible tests because they're easier and less expensive and it's really very difficult to add more variables so it's hard to test interactions and then you get something approved like something simple like glyphosate for example <laughs> and then you add things to it that make it even more powerful but the study yeah. showed that glyphosate wasn't so bad yeah yep yeah. yes and it's killing us yeah <laughs> lovely <laughs> I love the opening of the book where you talked about The Wizard of Oz. Oh, okay. Yeah. I grew up with The Wizard of Oz. It was one of my favorite films. I don't know that people appreciate it as much today in the younger generation because they have so many more choices and access well, to so many more movies. If you watch The Wizard of Oz now, it, it's still pretty, you know, impactful, I think. Yes. You know, and it was made in the late 30s. Uh, it's a, such a wonderful movie. And I'm looking at it again with a different eye. So I was totally engrossed in the romantic notions that were presented in the film. And I believed in all of it. And when the horses came out in different colors, I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. And you explain in the book how they did it. Uh, yeah, that was such, I couldn't believe it when I came across that. that. I couldn't believe it either. And I grabbed a YouTube video of that scene just to... <laughs> It. look yeah. at it again i thought um, i get i guess i can see that yeah i mean i would yes it, it is extraordinary but but all the all and i hadn't realized frank baum was a window dresser and had wrote books about dressing windows so it suddenly made you realize you know he must he would have been dressing these window night you know shop windows with these amazing new textiles and in, in dyed in all these amazing colors. So the, the whole thing sort of just made so much sense. Now, I'm not going to tell everybody how those horses were colored. If they want to know, okay. they're going to have to read a rainbow palette. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or do some research, <laughs> but it's fascinating. Very fascinating. Let's see here. Uh, and the other thing is when you, you mentioned that you would like to see more regulation, and lots of people wouldn't. And, and that was another thing I found really fascinating was because all these different countries, when they realized there was an issue and they needed to do something about it, approach regulation in very different ways. But those very different ways all basically legitimized the use of artificial dyes in food. So the Euro continental Europeans um, decided that... Uh, Partly because, I mean, in Germany, by the turn of the century, 90% of all the dyes produced in the world were being produced by German companies. So they really had a vested interest in not discrediting the dyes. Um, and so they, they determined, um, and they possibly couldn't, they determined that actually they would identify the dyes that they knew to be quite toxic and ban them, which meant that it, by doing that, it legitimized every other dye that wasn't banned as a harmless dye. And in fact, you know, chem chem chemical companies would then, or the merchants that sold the dyes, um, would then sell these dyes that weren't banned as harmless because they weren't banned. They were therefore harmless, even though most of them had never been tested and different new ones were coming out all the time. So if they weren't put on that banned list, they were just assumed to be harmless. So that in effect legitimized their use. Um, in the US, uh, in the pure food 
legislation in 1906. Actually, the dye one came out in the next year because they had so many to test. Um, they were going to test them all. And uh, the German chemist that Harvey Wiley had recruited, um, who actually lived in New York by then, to test the dyes, got like a third of the way through the red dyes. And he said, I, there's no way I can test all these dyes. So we're going to have to actually pick seven dyes that we are pretty sure are okay to use and just say you can use those seven dyes from which you can make all sorts of different colors by mixing them but none of the others are going to be permitted um and so that's an extraordinary tale because he he found seven dyes um that he was going to give to wiley and say okay these are the seven dyes we're going to say are legitimate to use and almost a week late just before the legislation came out he said oh actually i think i've changed my mind and they chose another seven dyes and and yet those seven dyes are still the seven dyes uh, most of them that are permitted now and you think that was such a random choice you know and the fact he changed his mind at the last minute and yet 150 years later we're assuming you know those are the safe dyes and and it, it sort of makes you realize but um, but so, so that strategy also, also legitimized the use of artificial dyes in food because basically those seven dyes became known as food colors. They were textile dyes originally. Um, and to be fair, the US government said, look, if you're going to produce those as food um, dyes, we want them produced in their purest form and we're going to test them so there'll be no traces of arsenic or whatever. Um, so there was some control, but but the, the very act of doing that said, okay, we accept food colours can be made by synthesising coal tar. And in Britain, um, the there was no, pres until that 1925, um, there was no prescriptive legislation on food dyes at all. Basically, the, the British law said, you cannot put anything in your food which is either going to deceive the consumer or harm the consumer. And then it was fought in the law courts uh, by lawyers as to whether anything put in. And, and so proving that these dyes were harmful was almost impossible. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the uh, conversation, um, you'd get analysts in one case as expert witness saying these are fine and then two weeks later in another case saying the same man they're saying no you can't use these so <laughs> so in effect even though we had th at least three different ways of approaching legislation all that legislation legitimized the use of synthetic coal tar dyes in food so be careful what you wish for when you want more legislation. <laughs> okay, I get that. I guess uh, it's a personal choice. Unfortunately, it's as being a personal choice for some people who are not adequately informed, they may make a choice that is detrimental to their personal health. And in some ways, it's a privilege to make choices. I know what my choice is. Uh, my dad used to say, if you can't solve a problem, eliminate the problem. And I say, eliminate synthetic yeah. ingredients yeah. in food. End of story. That would if be you're, my you're choice. In, if you're informed, and, and, and that's where actually food labeling, I think, was such a, is such a good concept. If you're informed, uh, then you can make the choice. I mean, it's not as straightforward as that because uh, there's being informed and there's being educated about you know what you do with so that. you know an ingredient in there but you don't know how detrimental it may be yeah right. and, it, has and, a, and, it has a nice name yeah <laughs> i can and, pronounce and, it and even then sometimes the act of informing can have uh the unintended consequences so in in the eu we have what is known as e-numbers um and the very concept of e-numbers which came about in the 1950s was that or maybe later in the 70s, anyway, was that if something had an E number, you knew it was safe to use in food. So salt would be E number, whatever. Sugar would be E number, whatever. And, and that definition of E was to make you feel as a consumer reassured about what was in your food. But now, of course, people look at these lists of ingredients and it's got E number, E number. 
And so enomas have become a term that is, is uh, a derogatory term for, oh, it's full of enomas, therefore it's all artificial. So, you know, that, that was a completely unintended consequence of that act. We learn so much over time, and I know we're going to learn a lot more. We think we know everything, <laughs> and we know so little. But even this idea, you mentioned the yeast earlier in the baking powder, we're learning so much more about bacteria now. We yeah. talk about good chemicals yeah. and bad chemicals. There's yeah. good bacteria and bad bacteria, and bacteria can be good in one scenario and bad in yeah. another. There's so little we know. But in that point in time, we had this hygienic sensibility and things made in factories in some ways seemed better, cleaner, yeah. Yeah. safer. Yeah. And boy, did we get that wrong. <laughs> so there you have it. This has been delightful. Yeah, very good. Very delightful. I really loved the subject, loved reading about it, the stories. Again, a third of the book is references. So you must have done so much digging. I can't even imagine to discover all of this. But there, that's what you do. There, there was a lot of work involved. And at least well, you can see that with, when you look at the footnotes and the references. <laughs> but I, I hope it's written. I mean, I did used to be a journalist. So I hope it's written in a style that actually there's a lot of facts in there. There's even the experiments they were doing. So, but hopefully it's accessible to. Yeah, the message is loud and clear. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. don't know that it's a good one, but science is not always truth or truth is. What is truth? What is true? Yeah. It's different in the eyes of the beholder. Oh, I'm going to stick with my organic beans whole grains, vegetables, fruits, <laughs> stay away from <laughs> processed foods because as someone trained in chemical engineering, I don't want the, those synthetic things in my food. Yeah. At least you know what you're dealing with. What do you, you know, what is natural food? Even we can't even get a definition of natural. No. So no. there you have it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Carolyn Cobalt, for joining me today on It's All About Food and for writing A Rainbow Palette, How Chemical Dyes Change the West's Relationship with Food. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I did. And now to move on to what's been happening this past week at Responsible Eating and Living Pandemic Headquarters, I have with me Gary Dimite. Now, what's going on in real news? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, real. Well, here at Responsible Eating and Living Pandemic Headquarters, we have been extremely busy doing a virtual food show that went live a couple of nights ago, Sunday night, across the country. We had participants cooking along with us. It was a cook-along, and the proceeds benefited our friends in Northern California that have a theater company, Playful People Productions. And we had a blast. We had we? a blast. And I think what we learned from it is that we'll do it again. Yeah, let's have one once a month, and we'll do it under the real banner this time. It was a lot of fun. What I, I really liked about it in this virtual Zoom world that we're in now, we spent three and a half hours with a lot of families who were in their kitchens cooking. We engaged, we worked, and it felt real. It did. It, it felt, felt real. real. It felt wonderful. And everybody had a chance to say if they were having problems, they would stop and we would take a little break and have a little beverage in between. Yeah, we worked hard yeah. together and we all laughed and enjoyed and we're curious. And it was a really neat way to figure out that this can work. Like you said, the food was delivered to everyone's home. And now that's possible too, with all of these online food delivery services. And they received instructions on how to do pre-prepping the night before. I learned something too. People like to prepare meals quickly. And I want to say that we took about three hours and 15 minutes to prepare a very luscious feast. This was not an average everyday after work 
kind well, of a, meal. This was a holiday feast that you would be proud to serve your family. Of course, it was all plant-based. Three hours really isn't a lot of time to do all of that. No, we did it all in three hours. Of course, there was a little pre-prep. They had to wash their vegetables and chop some shallots and get it ready for the prep. So we actually did take them through from top to bottom, except for the washing of the vegetables, which they did. Top to bottom, preparing a complete meal, including dessert, which your magnificent dessert. And we started with the dessert was just a simple poached pear with a raspberry coulis. And that's really a winner. That's a keeper. What I love about it is after having a big meal, that's healthy food but richer than we normally have day to day, mm -hmm. a holiday celebration. You still feel like you want to have something sweet. You want to finish the meal with a dessert, but having something rich and heavy, it's just not the right thing. And I love the poached pear because it's ideal. It's sweet, sweet enough, and it has an elegant presentation in its simplicity. It's just perfect. It's refreshing. It just finishes off the palate so nicely. Something to follow the meal Immediately following the meal is a fruit compote traditionally in a lot of cultures. And then later in the evening, hours go by, gifts are open, whatever happens between the after dinner part. And then late in the evening, if you want to break out a little cookie or a little cake, have a little tea before going out and singing carols. Going uh, out on hay rides. <laughs> going out on hay rides, going to the bonfire in the middle of the town square, whatever it is that you do to celebrate the holidays. And that's a good time to have the cakes or cookies or pies and things. But this dessert that followed this, well, I mean, when you're having a plant-based meal, nothing is really too heavy, but it can get a bit heavy if you use all of the vegan butters that are out there now and a little bit of oil and a touch of salt, some sugars and things. It was really a great way to end the meal. What I also liked is we planned what we were going to do, obviously, well, you and I we spent started. all day on the preparation. We, we planned set up it. the cameras, we set up the lights, we did all of the, the pre-planning, we rehearsed, we also sang some musical numbers because it was slated as Heart Glass and Dimite, the Swing and Gourmet's cook-along, so we had to entertain as well. So about a half hour or so of the entertaining was just that, us fooling around and entertaining. So I would think that the, the whole evening would be about three hours without the entertainment. But why would you want to have heart glass and Dimite without the entertainment? <laughs> what I was saying was we planned it, which is so important when you're making any kind of meal, something quick or something that takes a while. We planned when we were going to do what and in what pots and how we were going to take turns. Sure, we labeled everything. We put a label on every single pot. We laid them out on a different table. We had, as you said, the order in which we were going to take each and every dish. We took turns. I did some dishes, then you did some dishes, and I did some dishes, and then you did some dishes. So we cleaned up in between while the other was on camera. And yeah, I mean, I've seen some of these cook-alongs that only take about an hour. A lot of them are going around. I can't possibly see how that is going to be enough time, but I'll have to check some of them out and see if an hour is enough. Well, it depends on if people are cooking with you. Right, it was a cook-along yeah. as opposed to a demonstration. So demonstrations are a lot easier to take less time because you can pre-pep things and just say, here, I have chopped onions, and here, I've chopped my herbs, and you just throw them in. Right. But we did everything together on camera. It was quite entertaining as well. I mean, we had a couple of people that were just watching us work and didn't participate in the cook-along, and they were enjoying it. It yeah. was like watching a cooking show that was going on in several different households. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just go over the menu. So we talked about the poached pears, and we also made a raspberry coulis, which is just raspberries. I take a bag of frozen raspberries and cook them over low heat on the stovetop in a saucepan, and then that goes on the bottom of a plate, and you put the poached pear on top. You could drizzle some more raspberry sauce on top. If you want to get decadent, you can melt some chocolate and pour that on top, but we didn't do that. Then we went backwards and started at the beginning, Gary. You wanted to prep everything that went into all the recipes. We created this as both a cooking class and a cook-along. So we combined 
both of those elements. And so I was showing folks how to prep their shallots and garlic and onions and herbs. And that was fun. I had a good time with that. Yep. Chopping. You could we see how chopped. to correctly chop an onion. And I gave them the option of using a food chopper or a Cuisinart. And no one did. They all brought out their chef's knives. And I was very proud of everyone. Yeah, it was they really did the work. Fun. Once we prepped out all of the herbs and all of the uh, aromatics and things, we went to work. We made a kale salad, and I showed everyone how to massage the kale once you have the dressing on it, and that was fun. Get your hands in your food. And then we moved on to the other savory dishes. So we were making a pumpkin seed encrusted tofu, tofu steaks, which the recipe is at responsibleeatingandliving.com. And that involves making a breading of pumpkin seeds and spices, onion powder, garlic powder, turmeric, black pepper, and a little salt if you want it. And it's a fabulous breading. I call it a breading, but there's no breading in it, right? And we bake the tofu steak. And because the pumpkin seeds have fat in them, it tastes fried. Right. We've talked about this on the show before. It tastes fried. And the next day when it's cold, it tastes like that stuff you used to love to eat in the refrigerator that was deep fried. Uh, Yeah, you could say it. It's like a fried chicken. Yeah, but it's not. But it's not. It's better. And then we had a sautéed broccoli rob with pecans and garlic and herbs. And that shallots. was amazing. Yeah, that was very good. And surprisingly, Mr. D. Matei, who doesn't like mushrooms, insisted <laughs> on making a mushroom gravy. And in addition to the pumpkin seed encrusted tofu steaks for people who didn't want tofu, and that wasn't anybody, he also made pumpkin seed encrusted portobello mushroom. There was about eight or nine families. So these were big, these were families. Families of four. Everybody in the family was chopping and And everyone was involved. Everyone was involved. And it was really, I think they really had fun. I hope they did. And the last dish was the garlic mashed potatoes. So easy, so simple, but so good. Yes. If you have the right ingredients. And we used Yukon Gold. Everything was organic, of course. Everything was organic. That was one of the things we... um, asked for when the group did the shopping was that they've pleased about everything organic. Well, I think it also sped up things a bit because with mashed potatoes, for example, a lot of people peel their potatoes. But when I get organic potatoes, I don't peel them because there's so much nutrition in the skin. And you have no idea once the potatoes are cooked and mashed that there are skins there. It's just delicious. Yeah, skins never used to bother me anyway. But peeling them takes a long time. Right, so I never would peel them. I would always just leave the skins on. Oh, I didn't know that that's why we get along don't you eat the skin after you bake the potato i eat everything yeah you know we also talked about not wasting things during this cook along so we didn't waste the skins we ate them loved them we talked about the cooking water that we had when we poached the pears there was the pear water that cooking water it's it's like it's a liquor (laughs) it is it's a liquor i mean liquor doesn't have to be alcoholic and it's it's a beautiful pear liqueur yeah, it's a it's a nice drink. You can drink it warm. You can drink it cold. You could brew tea with it. Use it to sweeten your tea, absolutely. Or or if you use tea bags, heat up the pear water and drop a tea bag in there. Or even if you don't use tea bags, sprinkle yeah. some loose tea in you there. You know, Karen cringes when you talk about tea. I know, tea bags. I know. But a I'm lot a of loose people, tea person. <laughs> hey, a lot of people don't follow your strict they don't guidelines follow me. Yeah. when it comes to tea. And then the other water was the potato cooking water. Which is what I use to saute the broccoli rub. Right. It comes in so handy. And the idea is that the foods that you cook in water, a lot of the vitamins go into the water. Don't waste it. And then it imparts more flavor, another layer of flavor into whatever else you're making. Especially here at Responsible Eating and Living because we distill our water. So as we've mentioned before on the show, all of our water is precious. And if we cook with it or if we have some leftover tea, we always save it and drink it the day after. We don't dump it down the drain. I just think life is better because of that. That about wraps it up. Oh, like a gift. Oh. That about about gift wraps it. That's good. Put a bow on it. Put a bow on it. Hey, everybody. Have Have a a delicious delicious week. week.